Okay, welcome everyone. This is uh, next next round of the Lean Agile London and Pro Kanban community meetups. Um, we have our second Ask the Trainer, or Ask Me Anything as the Kanban Trainer session. And we are privileged to have John Coleman. John, do you wanna say hi quickly? Just say hi. So hi everyone, John hey, Jay. So um, John is, really, really influential in our community. Um, he's one of the founders of ProKanban, has been working on ProKanban probably since before it was called ProKanban. And um, he's also authored the new Scrum, Scrum, uh, Scrum? Kanban guide, no Scrum guide. Um, um, so he has authored the, the new um, Kanban guide. It's a fabulous document um, capturing the essence of Kanban. So we have an opportunity um, to ask any questions to John, um, to discuss you know, things about Kanban, how it's applied, the history, anything you want to do. We are, we are in Christmas almost, so we can, we can be having a good celebration of good things. So without any further ado, I think John is gonna do a quick presentation to give us a little bit of an appetizer. And in a, later on, well, please uh, ask, to ask questions, please put some of them in, in the chat. We will be looking for questions. We'll be sharing it, um, uh, having a conversation and, and see where it takes us. We have about an hour to do this. So um, let's see how it goes. John, over to you. Good stuff. Thank you very much, Jose. And uh, thank you, Ahmad, as well. Thank you for inviting me here. Delighted, uh, delighted to be here. Um, and so I'm just about to share my screen and uh, just going to share maybe three, three slides. I just want to double check, Jose. You can see Kanban guys on the screen, yeah? Just checking that uh, you yeah, can, see. can yeah. see. Good, good, good. So um, I guess what we should really start start talking about is, you know, what is the guide and uh, what's it all about? So you can find the guide at kanbanguides.org. Uh, you know, when you go there, you can read the, read the guide, you can download it, or you can just read it in HTML format. And there's also uh, two uh, related documents. One of them is the definitions file. So we're not trying to redefine words in the dictionary like that, uh, but we're just trying to say what we mean by words. Um, so there's a definitions file there, and there's also an addendum. And the addendum uh, is useful to uh, unseat some assumptions because you will discover some things that you maybe thought were part of Kanban guide, maybe aren't, maybe we consider them as optional. So uh, if you read the addendum, it makes it really clear. There's some things we say are recommended optional, but still rec you know, recommended, but optional. And then we've, uh, you know, optional not required. So we refer to some things that you might think are part of Kanban guide, but they're not. So definitely worth a while uh, reading, not just the, the guide itself, but also the deficiency file and the addendum. So what, what is uh, Kanban in the guide? We say it's a strategy for optimizing the flow of value to a process that uses a value, uh, sorry, visual uh, pull-based system uh, so as opposed to kind of pushing work in, uh, just because it's got a deadline, pushing the work into the system, uh, you leave it on a backlog or some kind of options pool, and uh, the Kanban system members will pull that work in when they've got capacity, when they've got some uh, time to actually do that work, they'll pull that in. So pull-based system is crucial here in uh, Kanban guide. There's different ways to uh, define value. Um, and we kind of went into a lot of detail on that in the definitions file and the addendum. Um, so it's not just uh, customer value and end user value, but also uh, uh, obviously organization values, but also maybe sustainable development goals like the environment, for example. So it, it doesn't all have to be about, uh, you know, uh, burning the planet faster. It could be, you know, how, how can we leave the world a better place as well or not leave it in a worse place than before the customer uh, bought our product. Um, there is a workflow as part of the uh, guide, the workflow section, the definition of workflow is probably the most important section of the guide, because that's really what your Kanban board is kind of, that's basically how it's designed. There's a small example here on this page, but we'll probably go on to a, a bigger screen to have a look at another uh, screenshot of that. I'm just trying to move forward here. And so um, this is a bigger uh, deficit workflow, I guess. And in this particular case, it does have a backlog. A backlog is actually optional in the guide, you'll notice. Uh, but there's a number of steps that you might have in your process. In this case, it's for 
a marketing and sales team and uh, they've got different stages that the work goes through and uh, they believe that it's good to identify the waiting time so they have doing columns and complete columns so you can see when the work is complete it's essentially a queue for the next uh, state if you like. There are policies um, expected as well so uh, typical policies you might have would be maybe uh, exit criteria out of each state so how do you know here in this case that preparing the work is done how do you how do we know alignment is done how do we know that we've executed the work uh, it's good to have an explicit policy that to you know kind of like a checklist to all for to all intents and purposes kind of identifying you know was it okay for that car to move from execute the work into review and amend um you'll also notice that there's uh other kind of policies as well there's a policy typically for which item should we work on today like that might be called um it's not part of the guide it's an optional Thing that you can have is kind of expected there would be some policies that you would have for example which card if we've uh five people in the team if you have a team uh and there's you know there's 10 items in progress which ones do we focus on today so that might be called a pull policy or a move policy you might have another policy as well for example which work should we start uh so if we have capacity uh which items we pull out the options pool or the backlog and and bring in to prepare the work in this case what what are the priority criteria if i like for bringing items in you'll also notice that there are four measures there and uh there i think the most important one really would be work item age if there's one thing that you can kind of get right it's like really focusing on work item aging um, in this particular case, on this workflow, we have one started point and one finished point. Uh, so the border between backlog and prepare the work is where we've defined that the work has started. And the finished point is where the work goes from make market ready uh, going into communications. Um, you could have more than one start point and, and uh, end point. It's not a problem. In this case, they just have one. And uh, the, 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 the work items that go within the start point and the end point, that's essentially the work in progress. Um, the throughput then would be the number of items that are kind of coming off the end of that, uh, uh, coming off the end point, uh, the how many items you're delivering per time unit, like per day, per week, per month, per sprint, whatever if you're using Scrum, for example. Um, and work item age then is, you know, relatively speaking, how old are the items for where they are in, in the process. You might have two items uh, going through the system, one in prepare the work uh, doing and the other one in review and amend doing, they're both six days old. Well, maybe the one in prepare the work is uh, more of a worry because ordinarily that work would have been done in two days, uh, two days or less. So uh, there are the four measures. Um, you can have additional measures, that's okay. Uh, we are specific about uh, flow efficiency being optional. If, if any of you follow Drunk Agile on uh, YouTube is quite a funny uh, series. Uh, Daniel and uh, Pratik uh, go through of some some topics, and uh, they're they're not fans of flow efficiency, and that would be kind of one of the reasons, I guess, why it's not in the guide as one of the as one of the key measures. You can do it; there's no problem. Uh, uh, we just say that it's optional in in the guide. In addition, you have a service level expectation. Uh, so this is an expectation that you might set with your stakeholders in terms of if we start one item how long is it likely to take based on his typically based based on history but at the start if you don't have any data you might just guess you might say well we think we can do an item in 20 days uh, in this case this, uh, this these kanban system members they have um they have some data so they actually know by looking at their their charts they can see ah oh, 85 percent of the items were done in 16 days or less 15 percent chance of taking longer than that based on the data it's not a guarantee it's just uh, an expectation so if you pick up one item, that's how long it might take. So this is what a, a Kanban board might look like. Um, uh, you can have all sorts of designs. The only limit really is your imagination. Uh, there are practices as well. So three practices. So uh, defining and visualizing the workflow. So what is your uh, board going to look like? Uh, I think I've done two of those sessions already today. And uh, so looking at you know what, what kind of work goes through your system, What's the start point? What's the end point? What are the stages the work goes through? What are the exit criteria? All that kind of stuff. Um, and then uh, you need to actively manage the items in the system. Uh, essentially, if there's work getting blocked, uh, metaphorically, that's like driving down a road and there's road works on the road and it's blocking up half the traffic and you could drive around it and 
but everybody's going to go slower when you're driving around it. So maybe you should try to unblock work. So try to unblock block work, blocked work, and uh, looking out for items that are aging more than others as well. Be careful that the new shiny balls aren't getting more attention than the shiny balls from two weeks ago. Um, so that's what we kind of mean by actively managing items in the workflow. And then, of course, you'd be kind of silly uh, to just, uh, you know, define the board and say, is that it? I mean, I had some people today had a call with me and said, well, can we change the columns? Of course you can. You can change them as many times as you want. I mean, how often should you change them is another discussion. But, um, uh, but of course, you, you uh, routinely, on a, some kind of rhythm, maybe you might uh, review and improve the definition of your workflow, essentially your Kanban board, how that actually uh, looks. Um, so that's essentially what's in the guide. You've got the uh, the three practices. You've got the four measures. You've got the definition of workflow. Essentially, you can use this for all sorts of knowledge work. We've proved it in a number of different areas. Um, the key here with Kanban guide is that uh, we're aiming it at knowledge work right across the organization. So it's not just for software. In fact, it's kind of aimed for anyone who's uh, needs to optimize flow of work. It could be people in marketing, and sales, HR, legal, science, engineering, and so on and so forth. So by having a guide that's really simple, um, kind of like the bare minimum that you would need, that allows you to get started, allows you to be consistent across the organization about what flow means. And uh, we're striving as well to you know keep things as simple as possible without being simplistic. So. Uh, there, we even though the guide is very short, um, there's there's a lot in there. There's, and so the be careful when you're looking at the definitions. Be careful when you're looking at the addendum as well uh, to figure out what you know what's really included and what maybe is is not so much expected. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say is that uh, by sticking to this common core, uh, it means that uh, pockets of your organization could decide to go to other approaches. Um, so we've been reaching out to other communities, for example, and uh, doing our best to not lack support for for their uh, their ways of working. And so, for example, Tameflow, um, Flow System, uh, Flow Consortium, reaching out to doing the best we can to try and, I guess, a best way to say it would be not lack support for those approaches, because we couldn't say it'd be a bit... Uh, uh, it would be really honest to say we support because there's this big bodies of knowledge there, but doing our best to not break uh, other flow systems. So if you want to use another approach, that's completely okay. So uh, that's all I wanted to show this evening, just kind of give you a little bit of a warm up in terms of uh, what Kanban Guide is all about. I'm going to stop my screen share now and I'm going to, uh, I guess we'll uh, be listening to some questions. Excellent, John. Thank you very much, um, John. While we before we go into the questions, can you can you tell us a little bit like the, 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 how how did this Kanban guide came to be? What was the original idea or suggestion? Can can you explore that a little bit, Lowe? So, yeah. So um, uh, Daniel and I worked on this together, Daniel Vicanti and I, and um, we were coming at it from different angles. Uh, Daniel has a long history with Kanban. Uh, I'm quite a newbie, really, in relative terms. I'm very active, I guess, since 2015, but a lot of people have been doing Kanban since the very start. Uh, my uh, entry into this work was uh, came about when, when I was using a particular agile approach and uh, the team could, uh, couldn't deliver, uh, they couldn't deliver value in 30 days. They just couldn't deliver in 30 days. But they were, uh, they did have complex work. Um, and so I was trying to figure out how to support them. So in January 2019, I wrote uh, Kanban for Complexity, Kanplexity for short. And uh, uh, so that kind of got me down the road of kind of writing some kind of an effort at a Kanban guide. And then uh, Daniel reached out and said he was thinking of uh, writing one and could we kind of merge our uh, energies, so to speak. And so what I did was I uh, essentially uh, paired back Kanban for complexity right back to a bear and I actually made that an addendum instead so that uh, one of the things I was worried about was not forking the community more by having Kanban for complexity, Kanban guide, all these different so just trying to bring it all back to a bare minimum. So uh, we started off calling it um, Kanban the flow strategy in uh, 2019 and uh, we got some nice feedback. The initial guide was quite long. I think it was um, depending on which draft you were looking at, it was between 16 and 19 pages. I think we might have got down to 13 pages at one point, but it definitely wasn't as condensed as the latest version. 
from July 2020 and uh, soon as well, the, the, the uh, slight adaptation that we're having very soon as well. So um, it was kind of like a lining up of the planets, I would say, really, Jose. It was like myself and Daniel were, we had different problems, but uh, coming together kind of made a lot of sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, John. Um, quick question. There was the, the, there was a question there, which uh, I, I'm going to reframe it a little bit. Uh, was, yeah. There were a couple of, a couple of questions joined. And it's like, what, um, you're talking about the, the four measures, the, the, the four measures, and, and they're explained in the guide. But yeah. could you quickly, like, why those four and not others? Or, or could, could there be others as well? There absolutely could be others. And in fact, in the addendum, we're specific about what others there might could be, and we don't limit it to that. Mm -hmm. um, people, uh, when I was showing Kanban guide to them initially, they were, it was kind of funny, they were saying, you know, that this looks like the gold standard, like, a, like what's the minimum? I said, no, th these four are the minimum. Mm -hmm. Like if, if you don't know how long your work is taking, your cycle time, right? So mm -hmm. if, if, if you're not measuring, uh, you know, uh, how, how many valuable items you're delivering, these work items are defined as delivering value, not just like, you know, going to lunch and having a meeting, you know, this kind of proper having value type work items. If you don't know how many of those you're delivering, uh, you know, that they're kind of basic measures, aren't they? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we know from Little's Law from 1961 that there was a kind of a triangular relationship between, you know, it's not purely mathematical, but, you know, it's kind of to make it simpler for people, average cycle time equal to average whip divided by average throughput. So you kind of understood that if you wanted to, uh, if you wanted to reduce your cycle time, uh, well, maybe you could re reduce your whip or, or you could increase your throughput. But of course, we know that adding people doesn't always come for free. So, so th it was going to be obvious that the three variables from the little as low calculation were going to be uh, crucial, absolute uh, crucial. But what I see a lot is um, uh, people finish work in a different sequence to the way they started it. And this is one of the crucial errors that people make that uh, you can use all sorts of rules in terms of how you prioritize work in terms of, you know, which work should we replenish or start, you know, which work should we bring into the system. You can use all sorts of fancy techniques, uh, cost of delay, you know, value divided by effort, whatever it is, or the value divided by the number of items, maybe. Um, you could use all sorts of techniques, but once the work is in the system, you've told a customer you're going to finish it. So just finish it. Do it as, possible, as soon as possible, yeah? Yeah, so like, so what can really damage the, uh, and one of the reasons why the cumulative flow diagram, one of the reasons why the approximate average cycle time is called the approximate average cycle time is because if you don't finish the work in the same sequence that you started, well, it's an approximate, and it could be a very bad approximate if uh, you put them in different orders. So it became obvious that work item age was crucial. And uh, with teams, uh, there's teams I'm working with right now. And uh, what I tell them is if there's, there's two things you need to do to kind of, kind, of, kind of get your flow back, right? So people do the online simulation where they do twig or something, everybody gets it. Then they go back to their work and they have a deadline on a piece of work. And oh, there's a deadline. So I need to put it into in progress. Wrong answer, right? So, okay. so. They go back to the office, I should be losing weight too. And you know, you can look at me, right? So it's hard, we've got habits to try and break. But what, what one of the things you can do, key measures you can take to improve your flow is maybe starting the board, looking, working the board right to left, uh, but looking at the work item age and zapping um, the items that are very, uh, a very old age relative to where they are in the system. If, uh, if some people use work item aging charts, like the red, amber, yellow, green, whatever. Green, they're kind of okay age for that stage. Uh, if they're red, so what I tell people is, can you just zap, zap those red items? Because if you zap those, uh, overall the, um, the predictability of your system will improve if you're trying to finish, if you're doing the best you can to finish items in the order that you started them. Because the reality is we don't really know how valuable things are anyway until we finish them, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, very long answer. No, that's good, good. Um, and and one, one thing that I would add as well is that each one of those four metrics cannot like connect to very common questions that you're going to have in business. Yeah. How long, how, how long have we been working on this? Hey, that's age. How long yeah. does it typically take us to deliver something? Yeah. That's cycle time. Yeah. How much do we deliver every day? You know, so, and so on. So it's always, 
that they're very connected to very, very important questions that will happen in business. Um, John, an another question that um, maybe this is for me as an observation. Um, I would really, really like the when, when, when in the guide you made the connection between like metrics are useful, but what really, really is useful is the charts, the visualization of those metrics. Can yeah, you that, a little yeah. Bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I actually think it was your advice, uh, Jose, that maybe made us add that sentence in. Because, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But because um, measures on their own is kind of a, almost a so what to them, isn't there? Like it's that old, like so what? Like so really, what we're looking for, and one of the things with measurements in general is you're looking at trends. What's the trend? And you see a trend when you look at a chart. Mm -hmm. You might see uh, throughput was eight items in one day, fantastic, and two items another day. But if you could see that even though your, your throughput was fairly stable all the way September, September through November, but end of November to now, it started getting weak. Uh, you know, that's something that we need to watch out for. Um, yeah. yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Um, let's, um, let's open the uh, question. I mean, some of the questions are here. Um, Harun, would you like to ask your question? You have a good question about like, um, what's next for metrics? Yeah, uh, thanks, Jose. Uh, excellent, excellent conversation there, John and uh, Jose. I could watch you guys pretty much all day if I had to, right? Uh, without even, yeah, and, I, and I haven't got paid for that either. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I, I've got a question actually. So, so my question is, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the Kanban guide and much, much of the Kanban community or Agile community, we are fixated on metrics, aren't we? Or just the visualization of metrics. But what yeah. is next? Uh, what do you see um, is the trend? or the focus next for whether it be flow metrics, whether it be lean agility metrics, um, what, what, what can you see as the kind of uh, the next horizon? Uh, or as, or as um, uh, using uh, Jose's words, what is the next Nirvana moment in metrics? I mean, we, we, we don't know the four metrics that you mentioned in the Kanban guide, but what yeah. do you see happening next in the future? Yeah, I can give you my personal opinion if that's okay. It wouldn't be an That'd official be Kanban opinion, but it'd be just my own personal opinion. So uh, one of the things about flow is uh, we do the simulations uh, we all get it we we uh, we understand it yeah absolutely of course we should uh, leave stuff on the options pool we should uh, we focus on what we're doing we understand that but we but we don't do it right so this is the, this is the challenge and so and what i see is a, an almost uh, a level of complicity that can happen and sometimes we say we're blaming the leaders but actually sometimes it's ourselves right because we want to be busy ourselves. Um, so there's that aspect. So kind of helping people to be curious about the charts. Um, so one of the things I do, I'm, I am a fan of electronic tools. And one of the things I do is I make sure everybody's got access to the analytics. If you have to pay more money, more money then that's fine. Make sure they can see them. Make sure they're curious. But also um, at an executive level, I would say, Harun, that um, you know, what are the other uh, kind of measures that we need to look at in terms of getting executives to pay attention to flow? Because uh, a conversation that I had quite recently was where teams were saying, well, uh, we feel like we're at 70% capacity. Another team says, we feel like we're at 90% capacity. Another team says, we, we feel like we're at 50% capacity. But actually, if you look at their flow uh, in all of their cases, more work was coming into their system than was going out. So they had an intuitive feeling that uh, they had more capacity because they're like being busy or they're used to making other people busy, but the, the metrics didn't lie, right? The, uh, that was actually showing that the system was overburdened, that they, they were like 125%, if that could be possible, right? That they've got too much stuff in the system. And I use the metaphor of a pipe, uh, a lot of water pipe. And I say, we need to turn that tap off. The water is coming in and you know the, the pipe is going to blow it's like and you don't you can show the cycle time charts and you can show the item aging getting worse and you can show the trend the timeline and all that kind of stuff that's all cool but i think what we need is um some kind of executive messaging kind of a storyline um that also ties into prioritization because what can happen sometimes one of the root causes for people starting loads of work sometimes can be that we're not clear what the top priorities are. Um, I'd love to quote from Jay, Jay Sutherland a couple of weeks ago or three weeks ago now when they launched the month ago when they launched the new Scrum Guide. And he said, when, uh, when your senior, senior leaders have more than five priorities, more than five top priorities, 
they're giving permission to the most junior people in the company to decide what to do next. And what can happen is if we don't have that prioritization of work coming in, then the teams don't know which ones to start. So then they say to themselves, well, the sooner we start, the sooner we start, the sooner we finish, right? That's actually wrong, right? So we want to start as late as possible. But if we don't have that prioritization clean, if, it, if the prioritization is a bit vague, it's like, we want you to do all this stuff, but we haven't said what's first, what's second, you know, what's, what's the sequence? Or even it's up to, it's okay to update the sequence, but if we're not clear on that, it's re, it's a real struggle for uh, for teams to stop starting, start finishing because they don't know which ones to finish first. Um, if that makes sense. So Haroon, I think it would be uh, more on the lines of executive uh, content that would be my own personal take. Uh, I would like to do more work in that area in terms of uh, helping executives to understand flow but also trying to uh, explain flow in different ways using metaphors and so on. Um, I love using uh, a, a guy I work with uses the metaphor of the Mont Blanc tunnel, like going through the Alps, uh, Mont Blanc. Uh, and so if you put, uh, if you fill the tunnel with cars, you know what's going to happen. You know, there's no traffic is going to come out the other side. Uh, executives love those kind of metaphors, right? So I think the more we can kind of be doing that and if we can kind of downplay our Kanban nerdery a little bit and just kind of just try to, okay, so here are the charts. What are they saying? What are the key takeaways from those charts? What's the storyline here? Uh, and what do we need to do to move from push to pull? Does that make sense? Thank you, Harold, for the question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, oh, sorry, John. Yeah, thank you. That was so helpful, by the way. Yeah, very helpful. Um, uh, the only thing I was going to add, sorry, it was... Um, I think it's Martha Ferris, her name is. She's a, a great Cambonista, but looking to flow and stuff. And I think she's kind of, well, she reminded me about how most of our metrics are more about delivery, the all delivery metrics. Um, and yeah. uh, uh, I just find that there's it's quite a hard, it's quite a hard area to look at where we look at value metrics. And it's quite, yeah. it's quite hard to, to really decipher or even quantify or qualify. Uh, or value or tangible or in intangible looks like but that's right but anyways but but, but i'm really yeah really really helpful john thank you for your um thank you for sharing that your wisdom really helpful you're welcome and one of the things that the, the really astute people what they'll notice in the kanban guide as well is even though we paired it right back to what how kanban was originally implemented we've also made sure that it's ready for the 2030s so um i'm personally a fan of the lean ux stuff and anything in, in the space of um can we do an experiment? If there's something risky, can we do an experiment with that and just find out if uh, you know if there's really value there? Build up some evidence. So um, you'll probably notice that, and particularly if you read the addendum as well, you'll notice that we're uh, discovery is something that we encourage. Thank you, Haroon. There is there is an interesting. I'm, I'm uh, talking about value. Um, I'm remembering Dan's Daniel Vagante's talk on Don Biaditka. I don't know if you remember that one, John. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there, there, there was an interesting thing which about these things like but value is eminently something that we typically well, we, we really know the value at the end of delivering it when we get the feedback loops when the market starts telling us what's happening so yeah. it's okay to have to use value as part we can talk have conversations about value the one thing that are, it's really important in, in our complex environment is to remember the value is not a certainty exactly in itself it's, it's we, we are probably still approximating guessing what the value will be and yeah. because and because you divide a guess of value and a guess on time and it gives you a decimal point calculation that doesn't make it precise it's just yeah it's still uncertain so so yeah that's a good point actually about uh, yeah. we, we talk in the addendum as well about mm -hmm. flow having a slight edge on value uh, yeah. when when you're uh, trying to figure out which item to do next so if we explore that, I mean, uh, I, I know that um, within the Kanban community, or at least the Plum Kanban community, there is more and more of a talk about um, if we need to prioritize something in terms of selecting work and pulling work, age or aging is a much better, much more reliable um, yeah. way of doing it, potentially more reliable way of doing it um, than, uh, than value and things like that. Shall we, shall we talk about a little bit about that? Flux? Yeah, I'd like to, a, a, little, a little bit of a snippet on that as well, because mm. um, uh, it's, it's kind of difficult to, to do that, isn't it? Like people yeah. struggle to, to do it. So there was one guy mm -hmm. in a large UK bank a few years ago, and uh, I was in a leadership class with him. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And he, he, he said, uh, he told me the policy that he's going to use when he went back to his team. Mm-hmm. You know, he's going to try and convince his team to use this policy. He said, look, we're going to still uh, prioritize based on value. But if it hasn't moved in four days, it doesn't matter. We're going to move it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting that he understood from a human point of view that the team is probably still likely to kind of pull the the, the most valuable item that we think it is. And his little kind of get out of jail card was they had a policy that if an item stayed there for four days, it didn't matter if it hasn't budged for four days, we need to start moving it because he, he understood that that was an aging problem. So he was, that was his way of kind of overcoming the human dynamic. And I'm not saying I recommend it, but I thought it was very interesting. I, and that's something to be really, really aware. I mean, uh, like what we tell people, you know, the way sometimes the way we estimate the work on air or effort or value, it's something that we've been doing a lot of practice for many, many decades. Yeah. Yeah. So someone comes and says, hey, you, you, you may, perhaps you need to do it differently or there is other ways of doing it. It, it can be something that is cognitively very, very difficult for us. We, we are so used to do it in certain ways and it seems to potentially work as well. So it, yeah. we have to be a, mindful of like those, those dynamics of yeah. habit and, you know, um, one thing I find very useful as well is uh, I'm, I'm kind of quite lucky at the moment that I'm working with four teams in the same team of teams, if, uh, for want of a better expression, like mm-hmm. it's kind of a, a bigger unit team of teams. And what I find happen, what what I find helpful is uh, positive peer pressure. Mm-hmm. So if uh, sometimes we can kind of be banging our heads off the wall trying to talk about flow, trying to get people to be curious about it, they get the theory, but then they get into the busy mode and just kind of go on the hamster wheel and just kind of do what they always did. And, um, and uh, if you can kind of encourage a few curious people uh, to kind of dig into it and rather than ourselves being the influencers, let them be the influencers and let them spread the word and say, oh, look what's happening over here, this particular team over here, you know, they've zapped all their aging, they've got nothing in the red, they've got a couple of things in the amber, but they're explainable. And they know why and uh, everything else is in the green it's uh, they're in good shape and and so when that word gets out and not only did they have better aging but they had more throughput their cycle times are much shorter and it just totally good so, and not only that but uh they were able to offer help to other teams in the team of teams to finish their work so they were saying should we start another item i said no absolutely not the last thing you should do be thinking about starting a new item because you're in a team of teams and the overall team of teams is overloaded so you could just unless you can do this independently, or you're probably better off actually asking another team, can you help them to finish their work? And that's what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I, as you were saying this, actually, you reminded me, um, some months ago, I did your uh, professional agile leadership class. Yeah. Um, really, really excellent. And, and one of the things that I remember you talking about was the many times we, we are not matching the conversations that we have. We may have very different understandings, different perspectives and mindsets, yeah. and, and it's, coming together, understanding where we all are and things like that. Exactly. So uh, one of the things, and this is what I was hinting at with Haroon earlier, that um, Mm -hmm. essentially meeting people where they are. Mm -hmm. Um, That doesn't mean that I'm going to be kind of supporting teams with blocked columns and all that kind of, but blocked column is usually a bad idea. Um, uh, Can be a good idea, next some exceptions, but usually a bad idea. And so uh, we try to kind of start with a bare minimum in terms of having good flow. Um, but sometimes what you have to do is you have to let, uh, you have to let the flow suffer and, uh, let them see in the statistics what's happening and let them come to their own conclusion, uh, about what's happening rather than kind of trying to be preemptive. Uh, oh, you know, this is going to happen. I can see you're going to fall into this pothole. Uh, you know, I'd love to do it, but I I could lose the audience. And so sometimes Mm -hmm. they need to actually see. And then they kind of they have their own eureka moment themselves, and it's like, oh wow, but like we're we're actually doing less work. We're getting we're le- or we're focusing on less items at the same time. We're getting more stuff finished, and we can relax. And we're talking to our colleagues. It's really really cool. So, but uh, it requires a level of patience. And uh, one of the things that I I love. Some people get nervous about this, but uh, I love when leaders get curious about the the measures. What can happen sometimes? The teams get nervous and say, oh. Uh, the, my bosses are watching the throughput now. So, you know, I, our cycle times are a bit long. And so, you know, what are they going to say when they see this item? This item looks like it's it's going to be held up not because of our fault. It's like uh, somebody else said they're going to be late deliver, helping deliver. So what are we going to do? You know, so helping the, um, 
helping the people in uh, the Kanban system members to kind of relax a bit so that, that they need to trust that we're going to make sure that the leaders will understand there are exceptions and we'll just make sure there's good signaling there. I always say to teams as well and leaders that I would never judge people by their charts. It just gives you some really good questions to start with and then you discover things about their work. Because like, I'm not a marketing guy, I'm not a sales guy, you know, so I have to kind of learn about that type of work. And then when I get more context, I kind of, ah, I kind of, so what I say to people is, you know, I want you to see what I see, but I also want to see what you see. That's the way I open the conversation. Is, uh, if that makes sense, Jose. That makes a lot of sense. That's excellent. Um, let's open uh, another question. Uh, Jersey, Jersey uh, Stavici. I know Jersey, Stavici. yeah. yeah. Um, you had a good question. Would you like, do you want to ask the question yourself? Yes, yeah. yes. This is the question about the Kanban for complexity because mm -hmm. John has mentioned something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So my question is uh, how you can uh, place uh, Kanban, for, first of all, what this Kanban for complexity is and how you can compare this Kanban for complexity to Kanban guide on one side to Kanban method on the other and to the time flow. So just to please bring us maybe a, 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 a broader landscape, a bigger landscape of how all these methods fit together or maybe they fit not together. So please yeah. explain on that. This yeah, no problem. Question. I'm just Good taking question. notes to make sure I remember everything that mm. you uh, you asked well, there. Okay. This so, is in the chat. This is in the chat. So I, the will, rem I will remind John. Yeah, no worries. Me. I'm not looking at the chat jersey. I'm just uh, looking directly at you and talking, fully engaged, listening to you. So, okay. So, uh, first of all, Kanban for complexity uh, has been attached to Kanban Guide. So uh, when I was uh, working on Kanban Guide with Daniel and with lots of other people who were helping as well, um, uh, one of the things I made sure was that I didn't break Kanban for complexity and also that I didn't break time flow, uh, that I didn't break, uh, break uh, flow consortium, what they were doing, for example. And, and slowly, slowly, I'm reaching out to more and more communities to, uh, to try and make sure that, um, that we're not breaking what they're doing. So essentially what I did was rather than decouple and fork jersey, what I did is I made sure the Kanban for complexity is essentially an attachment. It's an addendum, it's another addendum that's not visible in Kanban guides at the moment because it got updated. Um, so it's, uh, and what, the, what is the difference? Uh, one of the things you'll notice in Kanban guide is there's no team. Uh, you might think there's a team because maybe that's an assumption you have, but actually when you look at oh, there's no team there. Hmm. That's kind of interesting. So like, well, what we have, because you might not have a team, it might be a group of people or it could be a, a, a group of senior leaders that might not necessarily be a team. So we have flexibility in Kanban Guide or that. In Kanban for complexity, you really need, uh, the assumption behind it is based on Kanevin. So I did a lot of work with Dave Snowden and tried to align Kanban with uh, the Kanevin framework. And so essentially what I was looking at was, okay, so we need some kind of rhythm. And uh, it turns out actually the rhythm doesn't need to be so cyclical as I thought it uh, needs to be. Uh, I thought it needed, you know, if you have a scrum has sprints, for example, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be like, you know, every sprint is like three, four weeks or whatever. I had the, uh, I brought up the, the topic of rhythmic cycles, call them sprints if you want. Um, the key difference though, is that you just, and it has events. So you have your, you might have something like replenishment is optional. You might have a daily meeting. That might be a good idea to have a daily meeting. Anyway, it's a kind of hint of that in, in the main guide. Uh, there's a review, um, uh, kind of like a sprint review. There's a retrospective. The key difference in Kanban for complexity is that you're not expected to have, uh, as the, what they say in Scrum, a, a, an increment or a product that's ready. You just look at it. You just look at it the way it is. Your work might be taking nine weeks, twelve weeks to get done. Uh, it could be two weeks to get done. You look at whatever the work is, wherever it is, and then you adapt based on, uh, you know, using an empirical approach. You say, okay, so what have we learned? What uh, what experiments have we done? We might have some competing experiments um, to kind of test that we on the right track. So essentially, what Kanban for complexity does, it says there's two roles: team and servant. And uh, there's a recommendation that uh, if you have a team because there are no roles within team, uh, what you probably should do is have explicit policies about who's doing what. 
So who's going to worry about the stakeholders? Who's going to do the Monte, Car Monte Carlo forecasts? Who's going to uh, be worried about the right sizing if we're doing right sizing? Yeah. So uh, because if uh, I have this kind of bias and that uh, I think that if, if everybody is responsible, no one's responsible. So I'd rather that we kind of write down somewhere, okay, Jersey's on this and Alex is on that. And probably you'd pair as well. Probably wouldn't be just one person, you know, it might be Terence and Brianna might be on uh, working on metrics, for example. Uh, the other thing is there's, um, there's a heavy onus on the leader. So the leader, uh, basically what I'm saying in there is there's a lot of expectations from the leader. So kind of hinting at the executive stuff that we talked about earlier on this uh, webinar. So, uh, but to keep it very simple, got rhythmic cycles, kind of like sprints, except you don't need to have something finished. Um, there's some, there are events. The events are optional, uh, but you, some of them are uh, highly recommended. And we do have to do support the idea of teams and the expectation of teams. There's also some recommendations about what kind of policies might be useful when you're dealing with complex work. So that would be Kanban guide to Kanban for complexity, fairly tightly coupled, I would say, right? Uh, with Tainflow, did a lot of work with uh, Daniel Duaron and Steve Tendon. Actually reviewed their latest book, uh, Tame Your Workflow. Uh, made some inputs as well in terms of what we, what we did was we added some specific content for Tameflow in the addendum. So what we did was I agreed with Steve, okay, Steve, we're gonna have a Kanban guide like this. I appreciate you use different terms. Can we agree that this is the bare minimum? Can you go with this? We're saying, look, we're not lacking support for Tameflow. We actually saying, we're saying, if you do have a constraint, a theory of constraints type of constraint, uh, Tameflow is a great way to go. And uh, here are some boards you could use and here are some key insights you could get from Tameflow. Uh, with Flow Consortium, um, uh, I sat down with uh, Nigel Thurlow and reviewed some key things and I learned some things about uh, Kanban from Toyota, for example. And so that was very useful. So he was, uh, he had, he made a material difference to the addendum that accompanies the guide. So essentially what we did was kind of reached out as much as we could uh, to, uh, you know, Tameflow, a lot of work with those guys. Obviously I did Kanban for complexity myself, Nigel Thurlow. We did reach out to Mick Hurston as well. We're hoping to do more collaboration with his team to see if we can kind of make sure that uh, Kanban Guide doesn't break what they're doing. Um, I was involved in reviewing the Essential Kanban Condensed Guide, so I'm fairly familiar with what's in there. And um, uh, there are some key differences. And what we do essentially is we say in the addendum, if, you, for, if for example, you had been trained on Kanban method and this fabulous it's a fabulous approach, uh, fabulous trainers out there, brilliant professionals and practitioners out there. And in fact, we might say sometimes you might want to upgrade from Kanban Guide to that if you want to do something in, in, in their world, that's absolutely fine. The key thing is what we did, Jersey, is we said some of the things that the Kanban method would hold really high, we feel are optional in Kanban Guide. Uh, now, who are we to say it's optional? It's not, it's not up to us. Kanban, the people in, uh, who look after Kanban have every right to decide what they think should be in there. We're just saying from a Kanban guide point of view, if we're going to pair everything right back and have a guide that's like only a, a few pages long, and what we did was we said values and principles, for example, are optional. You don't have to, you don't have to use them. Uh, you don't have to have the agendas. You don't have to have lenses. Uh, we're not saying that they're not good things to do. We're, uh, we, sometimes we say optional and not required. Sometimes we say recommended and not required. So we did our best jersey to not break other people, the best efforts we could anyway. Does that help? Uh, you're yes. On yeah. yes, yes, thank you very much. Yes, okay, good, good. Thank you. So we had a quick question from um, yeah. Maro about like, so the, the work that you've done is aligned with um, David Anderson's Kanban. Is that, the, is it a question? Is it, it aligned? It was a question, yeah. And, and yeah, I, think, okay. I think your answer was yes in some ways, yeah. Yes, ish. Um, so, so like we're doing the best we can. You know, we can't like I can't say, for example, like can my guide fully support Tameflow because Tameflow is really strong on flow efficiency, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what we did was we added some content into the agenda to say, well, if you're going to use Tameflow, then when T Steve was involved and Daniel were involved, and and I really reached out to understand. I had loads of live stream episodes, really trying to understand their work. This is very very advanced. Mm -hmm. made sure I understood it and then make sure I wasn't breaking time flow, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, I did the best I could with from a Kanban guide, uh, essential Kanban condensed guide as well. I looked at the guide, looked what was in there. What I struggled with was 
I didn't really know like what if you what what if what if you take stuff out, which part of it breaks Kanban? And so this is one of the problems going back to my own story was I was kind of getting fed up of going around to these buildings and seeing these boards with uh, what might be referred to as proto Kanban or uh, visualizing crap on a wall, I call it, you know, just stuff on a wall. And um, it wasn't clear what Kanban was. So what we tried to do here, which might be kind of breaking some other approaches, but we're doing our best we can to not break them, of course. Uh, but uh, we're kind of being clear that you need to be limiting work in progress. We don't mind how you do it, uh, but we, you know it's it's pretty clear you, you should be doing that, and you, and the workflow is crucial to getting that workflow right. So this that's where there are some differences, uh, but we've done our best not to break them. Right? So uh, if you learn Kanban guy, you go to Pro Kanban or whatever and you need later to go to the team floor, or you need to go to Flow Consortium or Flow Academy or Kanban method, we, we've done our best to make sure that what we're teaching and what we're saying doesn't break, doesn't contradict in a major way what the other practitioners are saying from the other communities. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And, and it does to me. Um, yeah. Having been a Kanban method trainer for over eight years, Yeah. Say like when when I saw your guide, um, I've got it here. It's, it's eight pages long. It's not very thick. Um, it is really a condensation, a distillation of like Kanban to to its es essence. And I don't think there is anything there that, for example, will break the Kanban method. There are things that are not there as compulsory that people that practice the Kanban method will find strange. Like you are not, it's not saying at any point you have to use whip limits. That's right, yeah. In fact, because that, that was very influenced by Tameflow, because mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. Tameflow, with their flow efficiency boards, mm -hmm. uh, they kind of recommend that you don't have any whip limits at the start because you might want to find out where your flow is getting blocked up. And that's a common practice as well, many times. We'll yeah. say, you know, like yeah. show before you start fixing the system, um, whether you whether you let it show itself in in, in its true glory or, or lack of glory. Yeah. Um, and yeah. then that's, that's one option to do it. And yeah. that's, that's something that they think about like for why the Kanban method principles are not in the guide. My personal interpretation is like when we talk about starting where you are now yeah. and uh, pursue evolutionary, evolutionary progress, um, those things are not universal truths. The principles are, are meant to be universal truths and they are not always a universal truth. If you have a really, really, really ter terrible process, you're not going to try to say, hey, start there. You, you will probably have to fix it and fix it quickly. Yeah, good point, because that's actually one of the key differences as well. We, we're not, we're actually saying, if you try to do our assessment, for example, and you think you start where you do where, where you are now, mm -hmm. that's not something that we believe because sometimes you have to do something dramatic to change things. Yeah, and some, um, of, the, and some of those companies that we have probably, we have experience of working with or the best yeah. teams of companies, yeah. their yeah. work has been really nothing sort of radical change at, yeah. at times when the conditions were right were, were right for, for, for that change to happen. It's not always evolutionary change. Sometimes there is some very, very, very fast radical change happening. Exactly. So in, yeah. in my current mm -hmm. client, we kind of have a bubble of uh, high agility, if you like, mm -hmm. uh, where there's, it's like a revolution. You know, mm -hmm. it's like they move from a complete push mm -hmm. to nudging them towards flow and, and like analytics coming out their ears. Mm -hmm. uh, and operating some kind of cadence very similar to Kanban for complexity, I would say. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the rest of the organization is evolving then, but, they're, they're, we, they, but they still have a bare minimum of some level of flow management looking at the analytics as well. So you can do both. And one of the things I would like to do, I think, uh, would be to try and see is there more I can do to support uh, the Kanban method. Um, I did a lot of effort, uh, for example, with uh, Steve Tendon on Tempo, a lot of effort, Nigel Thurlow and so on, reaching out to me personally. I'd love to reach out as well to uh, the people looking after the Kanban method and see, okay, while there are things that we disagree on, are there some things we can do to try and uh, build a bridge there? I'd, I'd, I'd definitely be reaching out in the, in the coming months, I think, to see if we can do something in that regard, whether that'll be welcome to us or another matter. But I'd love to try to, you know, try, try to make sure that uh, when people are trying to use the Kanban meta that what we've done here uh, doesn't kind of, you don't have the client confused at the, hang on a second, the pro Kanban guy said this way, you're saying it that way, you know, there will be some differences, but trying to minimize those differences as best we can. Absolutely. And that's, yeah. that's a great thing. Um, yeah. We had a good question uh, about cross-functional things from Mimi. Mimi, would you like to ask the question yourself? You can unmute yourself. Hi, good evening. Hi, Mimi. Hi, Mimi. Hi. Um, yeah, so um, 
I know that obviously a cross-functional team is kind of like the ideal, having everything, every function within a team um, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I also know about, you know, the whole idea of swarming and the team kind of attacking the bottleneck and things like that. Um, I'm getting mixed reviews about whether that should happen or not um, from different people with their different views. So I just wanted to find yeah. out, I guess, either from your perspective or the Kanban guys' perspective, what's yeah. the deal with that? Do we, are we supposed to attack the bottleneck, even though, you know, maybe other functions within the team are not specifically geared towards that particular issue or that particular section where it's blocked? Like, mm. what's the, what's, what do we do? What's the best way or the best practice? So there's kind of two questions in there that I can see. One is about cross-functional team and the other one is about the constraint or bottleneck, as you call it. We kind yep. of changed the language over the years to talking calling it the constraint. Okay. Uh, so with regard to a cross-functional team, one of the nice things about Kanban is it's a bit more gentle. Uh, it has less expectations than what you're supposed to be changing, right? Um, so I, I, I had a conversation with a few people earlier from HR and they uh, I shared my camera, I started drawing some kinds of what do you want on your board, what are your steps and it was kind of, uh, you know, they had kind of steps in their process, they had a process that they were following. And some people had were specialists in some skills and some were specialists in other skills and we visualized the workflow. So there's really no expectation from Kanban guide uh, that you have to be a cross functional team. In fact, team is optional, even team is optional. Uh, so you could have Kanban system members, you could have single skill specialists working across a Kanban board, and you could have a multiple Kanban boards crossing a value stream uh, with single skill. There's no expectation there. In Kanban for complexity, we do expect it because you've got a team and there's an expectation that there'll be more learning, but it's still quite gentle in terms of, it's not as hard as Scrum and saying, you have to be a cross-functional team. Uh, it, it just encourages the learning, if that, if that makes sense. Now, the one thing I will say is that, um, I've been working with people uh, on Kanban outside software for the last three years. And I remember the first team that I did Kanban for complexity with in particular, uh, there were a bunch of scientists and engineers and they had PhDs, double PhDs, some of them published papers, very, very smart people, right? And so you would have thought there's no way that, you know, no way I'm gonna learn Jose's PhD or whatever, you know, and uh, learn Martin's and so on and so forth. Uh, but what actually happens is in the real work, we might do all these fancy PhDs and all that kind of stuff, but actually in the real work, a lot of our work is fairly basic. So some of your colleagues can actually do some of that work. And what ended up happening is when they used Kanban, it wasn't expecting them to be a cross-functional team. It just expected them to look at where the state of the work, look at the signals off the board. We can see that, for example, maybe your column is blocked and there's a lot of work in there and nothing's moving or whatever. It's a signal to the rest of us that even though we don't do that kind of work, well, can we help you? Because if we can, even if we're not as fast as you, if we can help a little bit to get that work moving, we're helping the throughput, right? So uh, what I notice is that uh, what's really nice about Kanban is that people see the signals themselves and then they realize that, hmm, Maybe I do need to kind of uh, do a little bit here and actually help help the guys and gals over there and see can that help there. And so it's kind of very gentle. It's kind of like getting to cross-functional teams through the back door. That's how I put it. You know, it's like the, the people themselves will realize that there is value in learning extra skills and they understand that to get the ball across the line, so to speak, that sometimes you might need to do stuff that isn't really your sweet spot. And that encourages learning and all that kind of good stuff. And so um, I would say, Mimi, from a cross-functional point of view, just map out your flow, look at where the issues are, and then try to, uh, uh, if you've got permission to coach the team, uh, ask them questions in terms of what do they see. You know, I say, I'll tell you what I see if you tell me what you see and all this kind of thing. And just try to open up the conversation and just see, can you kind of get people curious about what might help to improve their flow? Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, are you happy enough with that uh, from a cross-functional team point of view, Mimi? Yeah, that's really good. I mean, I'm the agile lead for the team, so and I'm yeah. very new, so yeah. it's like I'm trying to figure out yeah. the best way to approach the team. I don't want to go in and say, oh, yeah. you need to help your colleagues and da-da-da. I want, yeah. I, I like the approach that you said where, you know, asking them questions, letting them look at the, um, 
the metrics and say, you know, what do you guys see? And yeah. then maybe taking it from there, maybe throwing in some suggestions and seeing what happens. So that's really good. Yeah. Just on the uh, constraint, that's a very advanced topic. And just to tell you how advanced it is, I had four live streams with the time flow, I think six actually all told, to really get underneath and really, really, really understand their combination of Kanban and uh, theory of constraints and how that actually works. And so the initial assumption, uh, like for the lay person, the initial assumption is that if you map out your value stream, uh, the, the stage that has the longest flow time, cycle time in Kanban guide terminology, uh, is probably where your constraint is. Uh, but that's just an assumption. It might not be where your constraint is. Sometimes the constraint is the mental models of our leaders. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the constraint is actually the market. So, uh, and you need to be using a, a throughput accounting as well for, for chain flow to really work very, very well. And so uh, if you are going to, th if you are thinking of looking into a uh, combined theory of constraints with, with Kanban, I would suggest you look at TameFlow very, very deeply and uh, try to get yourself trained up by the by the TameFlow guys as well. They're very, very advanced. In, but in, term, in, in, in short, if you have a constraint, the, the idea is that, um, uh, well, there's no, really, there's no real point in improving anywhere else except the constraint because uh, you get minimal improvement because the constraint is actually what's slowing. This is the slowest part of the system. It's slowing us down, so it's going to affect the flow and, and all that kind of thing. Um, I had other people on my live stream as well, like John Seddon, and he said, well, actually, why don't you just move the people around? And so it depends on your attitude to constraints and, and it depends on whether you believe in theory of constraints. Or not. I personally do. I think it's very valuable. Uh, the first time I came across it was when I was giving training to um, a team in an oil company and uh, I discovered that what I was teaching wasn't useful uh because they had a constraint they had a, a drilling rake that was costing two hundred fifty thousand dollars a day and i said to them well uh, does that rig need to be busy all the time oh yeah uh, do those people need to be busy as well oh yeah damn right they need to be busy so they had a constraint so all the stuff that we we're teaching about not utilizing people too much and you know optimizing the flow and give them a bit of slack in that particular case that would have destroyed their flow so uh, be careful, I would say, when you're looking at constraints, look for constraints that are, I'd say, ridiculously expensive. Uh, if there's some particular constraint that's really ridiculously expensive, like that kind of hardware, physical one I had, if you have something like that, you know, look no further than TameFlow. Uh, but TameFlow is valuable uh, no matter what. I would, it's a really good piece of, uh, really good body of knowledge. I highly recommend it. Okay. Uh, sorry, that's the best I can do in a few minutes. Uh, we, no, no, that's fine. That, that's yeah. been great. It's given me somewhere to start from with yeah. um, continuing my learning. So I'm very grateful. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Good. Um, uh, we may follow up about the time. There's some, some two or three really great questions waiting. So if you don't yeah. mind holding on for a few more minutes. Um, but before that, as a, as a little bit of a search way, uh, there is um, keep the conversation going. We have the Slack channel for Pro Kanban. I put the, the link on the chat. Um, join the community, any questions, people there are there to help each other. So um, join the community um, in Slack and, and keep the conversation going. Um, we had a really good question from Brianna. Brianna, you had a question about like um, mature teams are starting to create. A, um, yeah, so this is a bit of an autobiographical uh, experience that's happening to my team. Um, yeah. So quick short story. I have a team, we've been, the, the, the bulk of the team or the core of the team has been together for five years. The three and a half years I've been involved, we've done really, really well as a Kanban team. Now culture usually eats anything for lunch. Yeah. Uh, so we are now, we are at the point where we're exhausted um, and our flow, we, we're turning on each other. Yeah. And, and, and no matter how much I try to explain, hey, here's our flow, let's adjust our whip. Let's, let's adjust our work hours, you know trying to make it as simple as possible for people to work. But unfortunately, we have ground to a halt. Now, again, a lot of the bulk of this is culture and, and mismanagement and the individuals involved in the team, their lives are falling apart now. Um, oh. and, and I'm trying to make it as easy as possible, but um, I'm, I'm a highly excitable scrum master and, and, and it's, it's getting a bit difficult to find that piece to make sure that the team can still deliver. Yeah. Um, we're self-managed, we don't have any guidance on what we're supposed to be doing. Um, we've had multiple disasters uh, and we're a team that's heavily dependent on other teams. 
the bulk of this is I need to find peace to help the team go keep going. Yes. yes. Our, uh, no matter how much I show the metrics of th this is what we used to do, this is what we we, we are doing now. Um, but, you know, let's let, let's fix our wits. Let's, let's fix our flow. What do you need to help make you work better? And it's 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 the more I try to help, the more I notice I'm making it a bad situation worse. So yeah, I'm looking for some encouragement here. I can relate to this from our personal point of view. Uh, I had the same situation about a year ago, and um, and one of the things we had to be very aware of as change agents is that uh, sometimes we're nice in small doses, um, and and I, I know I can personally be a bit of a sledgehammer sometimes, so you know keep me away from people. You know, just small doses, high impact is the kind of idea. But I had a situation where, um, yeah, the flow was awful. It was terrible. The charts were screaming at me. Uh, the last thing I should have done was talking to anybody about flow. I needed to deal with the human factors. And that's what I did. I met, uh, I think, 30 people one-to-one, -one, got to understand what was going on and understood that there were some issues that were there long before I came along. But because I added agility into the mix with Kanban and all that kind of stuff, it was just, it was just like a perfect storm and stuff that normally would only worry me maybe a year later after... Um, working with teams to kind of move on that path, it became an urgent thing. So there were lots of things like, you know, uh, how do we get rewarded? How do we get promoted? Um, kind of basic uh, human concerns about uh, how they're going to continue to work, how they collaborate, whatever, and so on. And so to keep the dressing room, so to speak, it's a football metaphor, to not lose the dressing room, uh, I knew that I needed to back off on the flow, meet everybody, understand their perspective, uh, make sure that I was acting on the human things as well. If there's anything that we could actually do, trying to do something about that and uh, and uh, just, uh, hope for some signals to come through that people can see confirmation that things are moving. And then you can kind of come back and say, okay, we listened, we talked, we're moving on, we still have problems, uh, but look at this, come on. It's like, there's, one, there's only one thing I want you to do. Look, uh, can you just look at the work at imaging chart? You know, Can you even look at it twice a week? <laughs> I'd love you to look at it every day. Can you look at it twice a week and just can you zap those red things? Can you get who do you need to call? You know, and it might be, oh, I need they're my items. Can you just finish them? Because like they're destroying your flow. So like uh uh yeah, that's just a personal story for me. I'm not saying it's a recommended way of going, but uh if the people aren't with you, if they're not listening to you, um it's very you're not going to make progress. So it's it's important. My personal view is try to deal with the human factors first. Okay, so we're on this. Yeah. We're we're in the same boat, effectively. Yeah. We've done the same yeah. thing. Like I'm having yeah. to do one on ones. Keep the yeah. peace. What do yeah. you need? To do? do you need to go work on your life before you come to the office? Because everything's getting dragged into the office now, right? There's oh, no I see. Okay, but it could yeah. be two ways as well. You see, because if people are overburdened, uh, they're going. Particularly now, since COVID, right? You got people going call to call to call to call to call. We've got Zoom out. It's not even don't even have time for lunch. You know. Um, some people who smoke, they 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 don't they they're looking for a minute that uh, a meeting that finishes five minutes early so they can actually have a smoke somewhere, and uh, and then the, 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 where's the overflow? The overflow goes into their evening and their weekend, and of course that's going to cause more pressure. Right? It's like a self fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. So not only do you have to be listening, but you have to be seen. Not only just seen, but you have to be acting on those issues and actually trying to get those obstacles out of the way. Some things we can't fix where it's not at our pay grade. But we need to make some improvements uh, because otherwise people will think, yeah, you're just sprinkling, you're just sprinkling Kanban over us, but uh, the same stuff is happening over us and around us. So nothing's going to get better. So if they don't believe that, if they don't believe in your, in your vision, if you like, uh, it's going to be very hard to make progress. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I, if, I, if I add one thing, I mean, I think you're talking in present time, Brianna, are you? That this is things that are happening right now. And going into the human side of all these things, we, we cannot forget that we are living very, very extraordinary times, all of us. Yeah. And there is going to be, uh, I'm talking about um, mental and physical debt, health debt that we are, we are going to be accumulating. This is, this is not normal times, like spending hour and, and hours looking at the screen, yeah. not dealing with people and so on. So sometimes what we need a little bit now is perhaps a little bit of like uh, ease back and say, look, you know, 
well, how are we doing as human people? How are we doing as humans? What, what, what are we going through, all of us? And maybe what you're, what you're suffering, what this team is suffering, hopefully something that is temporary. I, I'm hoping so, but um, I'm thinking no, because mm -hmm. I, I see like the cracks in the foundation. I see people's yeah. lives are falling apart and mm -hmm. I'm honest about it. It's like, I see it and I see mm -hmm. how you're responding to it. But at the same time, these aren't individuals who are necessarily honest with themselves mm -hmm. about this is happening. They're trying to keep some sort of sanity and we're seeing this globally, right? This is not a unique situation. Exactly, exactly. It, it just mm -hmm. now went from, we were already exhausted to now it's an exacerbated issue with no source of solution anytime soon. Mm -hmm. um, and, and trying, and it's like, I see you have a problem. I'm willing to help you with that. I mean, if you even have to work work half a half you know half a day i'm willing to you know accommodate that but at the same time these aren't individuals who are necessarily ready for that point of, mm -hmm. of acknowledging they've got a problem that's now impacting the team and it's not just one individual it's like every team member now and and these were yeah. long issues before the pandemic hit so now it's it's all coming to a head and I'm, and i'm afraid the team is going to crack so bad that we will be dismantled in the next couple of months um, and we went from a high perform, as quickly as high performing as we could go, to to, to now we're just imploding, mm -hmm. and and it's 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 a combination of factors, and you and, and you can't solve them all. Start with the human one, to the best of the ability, be there to be helpful for individuals. But at the same time, it's like you got a job, like like you got to be prepared to come to work. And if you're not ready to be here, then please don't be here. And I will help you get through those points, but. I know. I'm looking for encouragement to how to use the system to help improve that. And, and we do, and there was a question about, uh, that was sent to me, you know, do we have a, a measure for how our team is doing psychologically? The answer is yes, but you got to be honest about it, you know, and, mm -hmm. and yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. that no one wants to be honest that my life is falling apart and it's now impacting my day, right? Mm -hmm. But it's, and it's going into what John was saying as well, and, and we were talking about here. It's like, yeah, I'm, it's, it's, it gets to the point. I was talking to, to a colleague a um, um, couple of weeks ago, and he runs a company that is one of these kind of like the, the poster child of good agility in business. Yeah, small, small com company here in Europe awesome examples of good agility and he was talking like they're struggling, they're struggling because they're almost being victims of their own success of being able to keep up that performance, especially in difficult times. Yeah. So they are, sometimes we just have to go back to the basics and say, okay, maybe maybe what John was saying, maybe flow is not the right conversation right now. There is some very basics one. And they start finding what could we do that will address some of the problems that we have. And some people might share more than others, but you know, yeah. start trying to find what could be helping people right now in the current context. And then, you know, maybe, maybe flow is not the right conversation. Yeah, Maybe. just just mm -hmm. top and tail what Jose is saying as well. Sometimes, uh, mm -hmm. as Richard Hackman did loads of work on teams, didn't he? The U.S. federal agencies look at that. He's dead now, but uh, he did a great uh, mm -hmm. bit of research. Great book called Leading Teams. And for some unexplained reason, even high performing teams, if they're together for four years, their performance can implode. Just falls yes. off a cliff. And a little trick that they use in less again a large scale scrum. It's like a have this traveler concept where you kind of mix it around a bit you you don't want to be changing people every month or anything like but uh you kind of mix it around maybe once or twice a year you just kind of keep it fresh you know mm -hmm. yeah uh, but dynamic re-teaming as well um that's an, an, another aspect yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. i think yeah. the difficulty is with like trying to keep it fresh and stuff like that right now is because it's a pandemic you know yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, to survive yeah. you know yeah. are struggling as badly as those who are not here yeah. And and there's no it, it, just finding a gentle piece to make it even possible to come into work, just it, making even little wins or little adjustments. Even it, it seems like a, it, it needs a long runway these days. You yeah, know? an interesting thing there is like maybe there is some something that we can borrow from sports psychology and team management in the sports. Yeah, like you know some of the greatest teams you know have imploded and no one. It can happen. Teams team teams performance can expire sooner or later. Now, you know, otherwise they will always be the same champions forever. <laughs> so um, these things can happen. People will change, circumstances change. But yeah, I mean, this, what can you do to try to recover, rescue, support those teams? It's, yeah. Yeah. You, you, yeah. You, you brought up a valid point I hadn't thought about. Maybe we are at the end point as a team. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we work together well. We want mm -hmm. to pursue other options. Like we mm -hmm. love the work and the technical hard problems we've got, but... Mm -hmm we can no longer survive together it's time for some of us to change and, new and challenge mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it's it, it, it it's going it's it's going to happen. Whether it, it's just I'd rather us have the say in it versus someone else t tell us how we're going to change. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to dominate this anymore, but you've given me a good idea that maybe maybe it is. It's like this is. I mean, some of us have tried to leave the team or we've tried to switch out people, but uh, mm -hmm. we don't have the luxury of the say of how we get to work anymore, or we you, never did. Begin with. No, but, not saying um, that. Not saying that this is the case, but I was going to say, like you mentioned, uh, dynamic reteaming and and um, Heidi's book, excellent book, yeah. One of the one of the things that she has is about like how do you disband that team um, successfully and gracefully? How do you how do you spread that team to bring the goodness of that team to? I think what John was saying, even sometimes mixing the teams a little bit occasionally or allowing the teams to mix themselves. It's not you deciding that; they can decide that. So th there are there are options. I mean, don't don't have to be a straight away like oh, you know, maybe the Maybe it's not the end of the team, but but it could be. So important conversations to have to be had as well. Yeah, and and also just understand our limitations as well. So like, yes. if you if you feel you're kind of going into therapy, it's kind of the danger zone unless you're qualified, you know. Mm -hmm. So just uh, just be careful of that one as well, Brianna. I would say. And also be careful of being a scrummy mummy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I've, I'm already there. <laughs> Excellent. Like, like I have to back off, and and, yeah. and, I, and I, that's not my forte. I'm a very formidable scrum master, and um, I, as the only woman, and as as the mother of the team, as I've been called, and mm. I, I, I'm a terrifying force uh, for people to come up against, and. I have to like I, I know that's a fault and I really got to get back off that because I saw these faults a long time ago. I want to talk about them. Let's get it fixed. Not everyone's there, and and I'm just driving it a, a, a bad situation into a worse situation yeah, as a scrummy yeah. mummy. <laughs> Sorry. Ex excellent term. I love that. Okay, um, let's do one more question. Final question, and let's see if we can do it in just a couple of minutes. Okay, um, D D. What is it, Jiwa? Are you still here? Hi. There you are, yeah. yes, you okay. are, Andy. Yeah, you had a question about cycle time. Yes, I was curious in terms of um, your experiences in terms of how you capture your cycle time based mm -hmm. on your measure metrics, per se. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to pick your ideas of how you guys do it. Okay, so uh, easiest way to deal with that is to uh, just to draw something. Um, so, um, Jose, if you could just put me on the spotlight, that would be very helpful. Um, uh -huh. I need you. to find. I need to remember how to do that. <laughs> uh, well, maybe I could do it myself. But, I think uh, you can do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just see. Uh, I think you have to. Uh, yeah, I can spotlight. There you are. So, there you are. Yeah. I just did. Yeah. You. I just. I just did. Oh. Mm -hmm. So you can see my notepad now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. Okay. So essentially, what you need to do is uh, you're you're basically tracking a workflow, right? So you're going to have some start of the process. You're going to have a number of steps uh, through that process, and eventually you've got the end point. So usually there's some kind of a we're going to call it a started point. Uh, we're trying to be a bit clearer about calling it started rather than start, because uh, it's like the border. It's like the border between the the kind of the options, it might be options in this case, or for example, backlog in other cases. This is just one uh, flow. It doesn't have to be your flow. You, you might not have a backlog at all, okay? Uh, but typically there will be a number of states, uh, different in progress states that you might have in progress one and progress two and progress three and progress four and so on. And sometimes what you might do is you might have sub columns within those as well, because you might want to see where work is queuing up. Uh, there's two ways of doing that. You can go queue in in progress, you can do it in progress and done. So just improve, uh, assume it's in progress and done for, for now. So what you might want to do in this particular case is you might want to know how long is it taking to get work done? So let's say this is done at the end here, okay? Uh, so how long is it taking work to get through our system? And so essentially uh, you might say, well, this is our start point and this is our end point. And we say, well, our cycle time is going to be how long did it take to get from here to here plus one? Because if it starts and finishes on the same day, you don't say the cycle time is zero. You say the cycle time is one, you, you round it up, okay? But what you could do, you could have a number of cycle times because you might have other people in the team who are only caring about, maybe they just care about this particular column. That might be the start point and end point. 
for that particular uh, uh, work in progress. Or you could have other people who are interested in, in a different uh, start point and why they might be more interested in well to get from here to here. And uh, the important thing is that you agree at least one, <laughs> have one, and um, one is usually enough. And so when do we, and this is usually like, when do we kind of tell a customer that we're going to start this work, you know? Um, and, and when do we, when do we actually, make, you might, uh, you might deliver to customer. It might be end to end customer cycle time. In the addendum, you'll see a, a visual uh, from the Tameflow book. Uh, also, I think Andy Carmichael had some, uh, some involvement in that diagram as well. And uh, essentially we show all different types of cycle time, uh, customer end to end cycle time, lead time, all different types of time and process, all the kind of thing. But essentially in your workflow, you'll have a number of steps and you'll decide there's a start point, there's an end point, and that's there, that's your cycle time. Uh, does that help? Yeah, so the ideal one would probably be the red um, um, the red point from the beginning to the end. Capture. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. would, but, yeah, and what you need to do is, but you need to be careful because it needs to be, it kind of needs to be within your span of control, if that makes sense, right? So if like, if you have, uh, it doesn't have to be like that, but what I tend to recommend is like, if for example, this one is actually out of our domain completely, right? Uh, right. it's gone to the exec space, they're, they're doing some work, you might say, do you know what, we, we might actually go with the blue one because that's what we've got control over on our team. It depends oh. on the context, being honest, right? Yeah. Uh, but it's important, just have one start point, one end point, and then, of course, the amount of work that goes over that end point would be your throughput, and then the, uh, the work, the whip would be whatever between the start point and the end point. And then of course you're watching the age of the items as well. So you might have some items in the system and they're, they're not that old. So I'm drawing them as green. They're, they're kind of doing okay, but you've got other items and actually they're, uh, this one's been stewing here for a few weeks. Like this is in big trouble, this one. Yeah. Uh, so you need to look at your aging as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. I yeah. hope that helps. Yes, it does. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Yeah. At the, at the most interesting part, part of that, um, it would be that it's a conversation you will have like as a team, what, when do you consider work to have started and when do you yeah. consider work to be finished? And, and and this is interesting because in order to calculate a lot of these metrics, those are, those are the only two um, kind of like uh, times that we have to capture these things, yeah? yeah? For every piece of work is when did it get started? When did it finish? That gives you cycle time. That gives you throughput. That gives you yeah most of the metrics, well, age and so on. So it's sometimes people say, "Oh, metrics are so difficult to compile, so difficult to obtain." Really, just when it got started, when it got finished, and if it really, really is a lot of work, if, if that takes a lot of time, is because you have probably too much work going on. Yeah, usually is. <laughs> yeah. So so then the so the problem of capturing the metrics is not that the metrics are difficult; is that we have too much work. We're yeah. trying to do too much work. So, hey, that maybe is an interesting conversation. Okay, could we do less work? Can we have? Can we increase our our chances of doing work better? That is not so old and it takes so long. Um, yeah. But that was a great question, Lee. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I'm mindful that we have totally overrun. Now we are in proper Spanish time. <laughs> you know, and and it's getting to Christmas. Um, so it's probably time to get back to the families, back to some of us, back to work. Um, so I just wanted to say. To all of you, thank you very much for, for the time today. Thank you for all the questions. It's been excellent questions, excellent conversations. Really, really enjoy that. This session has been recorded. So we will try to publish it well, as soon as possible on the um, on the Lina Jal London playlist on YouTube. And we will put the link both in the uh, Lina Jal London meetup group, in the ProCamban community meetup group, and in the Slack channel for ProCamban as well, maybe other areas of social media. Um, we, we haven't advertised any, any of the next sessions for next year. We got, we're working on some of those. We will have sessions like this with other Kanban trainers, um, you know, people like, you know, like John who deliver training. Um, if you're really, really curious about um, learning more about Kanban, John, I think you have a very early New Year present. Um, you're yeah. starting early next year. <laughs> I am, yeah. East Coast, US, and uh, European time classes yeah. in the first two weeks of January, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jose, you've got some as well in February, is that right? March, so oh, too far okay. away, too yeah. far away. Okay. But yeah, I mean, if you're interested in learning more about ProCamban, um, you can go to ProCamban.org. There is there is courses listed there. There is the community. So questions like these are excellent. You know, they will generate a lot of conversation and a lot of advice and help and support within the community. So yeah, we can all help each other. Um, 
Thank you very much again. Enjoy a really, really good um, festive season. Switch off the computer. You know, I, I have um, asked my wife that next Wednesday she can hide my computer for two weeks. So maybe that's something that we all want to do. <laughs> yeah. So we'll see you on the other side. I mean, 2020 has been an enormously long year, difficult year. So hopefully, I, mean, I say that 2020 has lasted 10 years, not one. Yeah. So um, best wishes for, for the holidays, best wishes for next year. We'll see you again in, in the new year. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Happy guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye.